It's Bobby Beck for a Brew Matrix video today. We're going to be comparing uh, a couple different versions of uh, boils and fermentations, and uh, we're going to be doing a cream ale. I'm going to be doing the mash in my original brew kettle uh, using the brew in a bag method, and uh, we're just going to be producing the wort in in this mash and then we're going to be distributing the wort into the smaller brew matrix kettles uh, in two different uh, variables. Uh, the first variable on the initial transfer is going to be uh, super clean wort uh, that I derive from the recirculation before I ever touch the bag and pull it out and uh, squeeze it and, and so on. I'm going to be taking the absolute cleanest. So this is going to be very similar to uh, the clean wort runoff on a three vessel system when uh, after the mash had been recirculating the entire time or uh, after having been Vorloft uh, to the point where it's uh, very clear at that point. So the first two kettles, uh, the, the smaller brew matrix kettles, the first two are going to get the super clean wort, leaving all the fines behind trapped in the grain uh, body itself. Then uh, I'm going to pull the bag up, give it a really good squeeze, and then I'm going to stir up all the wort in the kettle and then transfer that homogenous liquid into kettle number three and four. The reason for this test is that uh, a lot of people argue that the reason why brewing a bag as a technique is uh, problematic or potentially problematic is because of all the fines that make it into the boil. And it's proposed that those fines, uh, having been in the boil for that whole 60 to 90 minutes, whatever it may be, are going to be contributing off flavors that cannot be reversed. It's not really a matter of whether or not these things will ever get out of the beer. It's just a matter of whether they do damage to the flavor of the beer while they're in the boil for that 60 to 90 minutes. But since we have four kettles, what we're going to also test is how important it would be to get the wort from the boil into the fermenter in a clean way or not. So we've got a clean boil uh, or a dirty boil, and we also have a clean transfer to fermentation or a dirty transfer like with all the troops. So we're going to serve this beer at one of my homebrew club meetings in uh, probably a month or so and we'll find out if there's any preference there are some bjcp certified and national judges in the club so i definitely want to make sure that they're going to be attending that meeting and provide some feedback they will not know what the variable is and they certainly won't know which uh they're tasting at any given time so it's going to be pretty interesting um i want to just be clear that this is not proving anything. I would probably want to repeat this with a different beer style and see what happens. Uh, but if it's repeated and there is a significant difference between them, I will probably change the way that I brew. And uh, because I just kind of go to where the data tells me. So hope you find this one interesting. I'm certainly interested in knowing what, what's going to happen and uh, I'll keep you updated. You can't really read newsprint through it, but this is as clear as any work I've seen coming out of a three vessel. I definitely don't want to oxidize the work and have that be the reason why there's a difference. So I'm going to try to squeeze this bag as low down in the kettle as I, as I can. And uh, normally it, I wouldn't have to do this because the work is much higher up, but really do want to get sort of the worst case scenario, uh, which is also why I crush this grain a little bit finer than I normally would. Go 
fill up the rest of the boilers here. Let's stop at the 200 degree target um, and then just give everything a good stir and then I'll be able to watch for the boil over and adjust it so we don't make a big mess here. All right. Just turn the flames off just now or shut the power off. It looks like every single one of these. All right, so the clear wort ones, there are protein flux in there. Uh, this is with pre whirl flock. I'm going to actually throw the whirl flock in with the um, with the whirlpool hops. But the wort in between the flocks does look cleaner or clearer on the uh, the clean. The flocks are more plentiful and they're smaller in nature, and it looks like there's just a lot more of it in the dirty wort ones so uh, let's see how this is going to go the goal first was to get um pears under 100 degrees i did a um i did one gram of galena hops uh as a 200 degree hop stand and i also had um a tenth of a gram of whirl flock in those at the same time and once i got that under the the first pair under 100 i um i did the uh the hop stand on the other two while holding 200 degrees for three minutes and then i moved the immersion chillers over to the other pair got those down below 100 very quickly and then i kind of just moved the chillers around uh bringing them down now the 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 two that i focused on getting down uh to 67 are the ones that are going to be the clean ferment ones i wanted to give them a little bit of an extra opportunity to settle out whereas the two that i'm chilling down to 67 at this point those are going to just be completely re-stirred up when i do the transfer so i'm going to intentionally make that as dirty as possible going into the fermenter uh, despite having the whirl flock uh, in there anyway so we use the uh, 2.1 gallon oxy bar kegs for the fermenters. Well, this is the collection of the dirty ferment ones, and it seems so wrong to do this now that it's nice and clear and just stir it all up. Uh, seems like a terrible idea. I don't know whose idea this was. What? Honestly, you know, you want to experiment, you got to do it. All right, this is representative of what went into the fermenter out of this experiment. And there is an obvious brightness to the clean boil uh, sample here. This one has a slight haze to it. This is like, this is like a dry hopped, you know, blonde ale or something like that. And this is... This looks like it's been lagered. It, it's bright. It looks like it's been filtered. Um, now, here's here's the real question, though, is, uh, you know, even though, like, this looks like the finished beer that I'd like to be drinking out of these four, but this is pre-fermentation, obviously. It really doesn't say anything about what the finished beer is going to look like or taste like, so... Uh, we we have to wait for that one, but uh, it's pretty impressive that uh, keeping the fines out of the boil um, and then uh, using whirl flock and letting it settle after chilling, that's the work that you get out of it, and uh, that's about as clear as I've ever seen it. So, so to just get a little bit better of an idea of how much of the post boil kettle troop actually made it into the fermenters, the one on the left. That was carefully racked after a good settling into the fermenter. And the one on the right shows how much of that troube actually made it into the fermenter because on that one, we stirred and transferred as much as 
we needed in volume into the fermenter. So the difference in true between these two kettles is how much made it into the fermenter on the one that we would call dirty boil, dirty fermenter. A couple of post-boil observations. Most of these original gravities were about 1048. The highest was 1050, and then we had one at 1049. But I don't think they were driven by anything other than slight variations in the power output of the boilers. So I think we had a little bit of variation in the boil off rate. I don't think there's enough of a variation there that it affected the overall perception of the beers in their final drinking state. Okay, so um, fermentation speed. The two that you can kind of see on the right that both have uh, about a quarter inch of croissant developed on the top at the 12 hour mark, those are both the dirty fermenter ones. So regardless of if the boil was clean or dirty, uh, those two are the ones that got racked from the fermenter with all the post-boil trube uh, transferred over. Now there is also a an image here that was uh, about 24 hours after pitching, and you can see that the two clean fermenter ones have started fermenting, and they look at 24 hours what the other ones look like at about 12 hours, but they are actively fermenting now. Okay, a quick overview of the fermentation profile. Uh, we started out uh, at about 67 degrees uh, pitching. About a week later, I ramped it up to 71 for uh, just kind of a forced diacetyl rest there. And it stayed there for the following week. And then uh, I just did a soft crash down to 60 before I transferred it over to the serving kegs. You see the uh, gravity dropped from about 1049 down to 1007, 1006, somewhere around there. They were measured with the easy dens essentially ended up at 5.5% ABV. There is an image here of what the four samples looked like on the day that they got moved into the serving kegs. Perhaps the fourth sample, CBDF, was the clearest of all of them, but for the most part, they were quite similar. So there were a total of 19 tasters, and each taster was served a clear cup of the variable samples A, B, C, and D, and then a fifth cup that was labeled E was also numbered with 1, 2, 3, 4 in a random fashion. So we filled the E cups with its corresponding number cups. So just as an example, E2 was filled with the same sample that B had. So, you know, E1 was A and so on. The tasters were just told that they have five samples of beer brewed with the same ingredients, basically a cream ale, that one or more of the samples could have some process variation that impacted the beer. What we asked was, what is your BJCP judge rank if you have one? Also, tell us what number was on your e-cup before smelling or tasting any of the beers to please evaluate the clarity Assign a number from one to five for each of the beers, with one being very hazy and five being very clear. And then after smelling and tasting the beer, they were asked to assign an overall quality score from one to ten, with one being terrible and ten being fantastic, considering drinkability, balance, intangibles, and any off flavors, basically how good or bad the beer is in their opinion. So the tasting was performed by 19 people, including the following BJCP judge ranks. One was a national, two were certified, and two were recognized. The ratings for each of the beers uh, were summarized or evaluated in a couple of different ways. Now, we averaged the clarity ratings, and it's kind of obvious that D is the clearest by far, and then um, the two middle ones, the, um, the B and C, are kind of close together, and uh, A was the least clear. So the only thing that changes when you use median instead of average is that A and C basically tie each other for third place. All right, now let's look at the overall ratings. 6.37 was the highest, and that was for D, and then the second is 6.05. So the ranking through the average process is D is the first best, and then B, and then C, and then A. What happens when you shift over to median is that B and D are tied for first, and then it goes C and D. So the extremes really don't change all that much. So we could say that D was generally the best and A was the worst.
So what kind of conclusions might we draw from this? Well, as far as the clarity goes, it appears that wort with higher levels of kettle troop present has a shorter lag time, ferments faster, clears faster, and ends up clearer after moderate aging than the alternatives. And this was corroborated with several different trials performed by Brulosophy. Well, being extremely careful about racking only the cleanest word over, using any kind of filtering mechanism or anything like that, or doing a very extended whirlpool rest where everything settles out perfectly, it seems like all of that is a waste of time and effort and potentially equipment if you buy something specifically for that purpose. So if we were to draw the conclusion that getting a lot of mash fine material into the boil kettle is a detriment, like I think this tasting experiment has suggested so far, what you would want to do is perform some steps to mitigate how much of that fine material makes it into your boil. And I think if you have a system that has a dedicated mash ton and uh, you run that wort off to a boil kettle separate vessel, as long as you're running clean wort off of the mash ton into the boil, you got no problem there. Now, if you're using a system like an all-in-one or a brew-in-a-bag rig, I think there's two things that you'd want to do. One is to not go absolutely nuts with the crush through the mill. Now, if you're buying your grain somewhere at a homebrew store, you know, and they give you the option, maybe don't tell them to double mill or to mill it as fine as they can get away with. Maybe going with a standard crush would be better because you'll still get the conversion that you're looking for. You won't have as many super fine particles to worry about. When you're pulling the grain bag or mash basket or malt pipe, whatever you want to call it, when you're pulling it out, do it slowly. So I prefer using some kind of locking rope hoist to lift these things out. The more violently the baskets are draining, the more likely they are to pull a lot of the fines out with the work. So what I would prefer is that you can incrementally lift the malt pipe out like maybe a, an inch at a time and leave it in its locked position. And you can do that with a ratchet strap or uh, one of these locking pulleys with rope. And uh, you can slowly withdraw the grain to just minimize how much of those fine particles actually get drawn out of the grain. The other thing is just limiting how much you squeeze. If you have a malt pipe, don't push down on the grain. And if you've got a bag, don't squeeze it. And you'll have to use a little bit of trial and error to figure out, you know, how to compensate. So maybe increase your absorption ratio. You'll start with a little bit more water uh, in the beginning uh, because more of it's going to stay in the grain without a squeeze. And then also you're going to want to lower your brew house efficiency by a couple of percent, at least initially. Um, this is somebody who does not squeeze the bag at all. So they have already adjusted their equipment profile numbers to deal with a little bit more absorption uh, volume than most Bruna baggers would probably consider because uh, there's no squeezing of the bag. And it's kind of interesting. You could see in this picture that this half gallon or so of wort that came out of the bag last is quite clear. So, well, here's one data point that shows as long as you're milling moderately and not completely obliterating your grain and that you don't actively squeeze the absolute most wort out of the bag that you can, that the wort that makes it into the boil kettle is relatively clean. And it's definitely nowhere near as murky as the stuff that I boiled in this experiment. So I think I want to just close this uh, long video with I want to be careful not to suggest that any sort of conclusive proof has been made here. Most importantly, I want to hear what you guys think about this. And I want to hear your questions about the process and looking forward to engaging everybody about this. And it was a lot of work, but I think it was uh, really interesting and eye-opening to, uh, to see what happened. So let me know what you think. Cheers.